Hello family, we bless the name of the Lord for today. We give him glory, we give him honour because he is great and greatly to be praised. Today I'm reading Genesis chapter 12 from verse 1 to verse 9. Now in Haran the Lord had said to Abram, Go away from your country, from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you abundantly, and make your name great, exalted, distinguished. And you shall be a blessing, a source of great good to others. And I will bless, do good for you, benefit those who bless you. And I will curse, that is, subject to my wrath and judgment, the one who curses, despises, dishonors, has contempt for you. And in you, all the families, nations of the earth will be blessed. So Abram departed in faithful obedience. I want you to take note of that. As the Lord had directed him and Lot, his nephew, left with him. Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran. Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his nephew, and all their possessions which they had acquired, and the people's servants which they had acquired in Haran, and they set out to go to the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land as far as the site of Shechem to the great terebinth oak tree of Moreh. Now the Canaanites were in the land at that time. When the Lord appeared to Abram, sorry, it's the, then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, I will give this land to your descendants. So Abram built an altar there to honor the Lord who had appeared to him. Then he moved on from there to the mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west of and I on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called on the name of the Lord in worship through prayer, praise and thanksgiving. Then Abram journeyed on, continuing toward the Negev, the south country of Judah. Today, I want to share with you that faith makes the calls, the chosen say yes to God. Abraham, I started talking about him yesterday where I read this passage of scripture that God had chosen, singled him out amongst his father's children, singled him out amongst his relatives, singled him out amongst the people that were living in his um, community at the time as the one that God decided to choose, to set apart. And when God sets him apart, he then sends him on an assignment and says to him, to leave everything that he knows, his establishment, everything he deserves for himself, and to go to a place that God would show him. And the Bible makes us understand that the only thing God said to him after he had said to him to leave was that he was going to bless him. And one of the things he had said was that he would make him into a great nation. He would bless him abundantly. He would make his name great. He would cause him to be a source of great blessing to others. And in him, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. We know that in life we've told um, that one of the good things or the basic things we do in life, which is wisdom, is that we plan. We plan our future. And so even in order for us to plan, we set goals, sometimes short term, sometimes long term goals. And the idea is that those goals drive the actions and the decisions that we make. And when we make plans, we are also taught that one of the wisest things we need to do is to do a risk assessment of the plans that we, we make to weigh the pros and cons and to try as much as possible to do um, embark on plans that is not high risk or plans that, you know, we can actually justify. If somebody was to ask us, why are you doing this or that? We can actually justify that. But in, in Abram's case, he was not given an opportunity to justify what it was that God was asking him to do. It was a case of he heard the word of the Lord. He had to make a choice either to follow what God was telling him to do or not to. The only assurance God gave him was that he would bless him as a result of this assignment that God was asking him to do. God didn't give him the full footprints. He didn't even tell him where he was going to go to. He says, start the journey and I will show you what I need you to do or where it is I will be taking you to. It could have only been faith that would have made Abraham even decide to do what God was asking him to do. 
Let's bear in mind he wasn't somebody that was poor. He wasn't somebody that didn't have um, know where his life was heading towards. He was a man that was blessed. And so the Bible makes us understand that by the time he was even obeying what God had told him to do, one, he was 75, he had servants. He was a wealthy man when he started this journey. Because often we can think that, oh, maybe it was so easy for him to do because perhaps he didn't have property. He didn't have an established life. He didn't have an established business. He was just, you know, somebody who didn't really know where his life was going. So maybe when God came and spoke to him, it was just his way out to just go and try something out because everything else he had tried maybe was not working out. But no, he was an established man. He was a man of great wealth, which is why he had servants. But... In verse 4 of Genesis 12, it says, So Abraham, in spite of everything that he had, in faithful obedience, departed as the Lord had directed him. And so it is with us, that for any of us who has accepted Christ as Lord and Savior, we were told that Jesus is the Son of God, that he's the one who takes away the sins of mankind. We were taught that we were all born in sin, that the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life, salvation in Christ Jesus. We were en- encouraged to let go the life we know and to take on a new life in Christ Jesus. We did not know exactly how our day-to-day life would go, but we were given the assurance of salvation and we said yes to the call of Christ. When we've said yes to the call of Christ, as we journey with him, he begins to unfold to you and I the plan and the purpose for which God created us individually and why God perhaps has chosen us in certain spheres of life. Maybe he reveals to you why he perhaps chose you to be the firstborn of your parents' children. Maybe he reveals to you why he chose you to live in a particular community. Maybe he reveals to you why he chose you to be a member of a particular family. Maybe he begins to reveal to you why he chose you to work in a particular location. But then as he reveals these things to us, very often God would beckon us or call us or or say to us to do or to embark on a particular assignment. And it will take faith when we do not have the full picture to be able to say yes to the call of God or to whatever it is that God is asking us to do. Because bear in mind, the story of Abram would not have ended up to be what we know it to be if when God spoke to him and said to him, depart from your father's house, from your relatives, leave that which you know, that which you're familiar with to a place I will show you. If he had not said yes, he would not have been able to embark on that journey. And so for many of us, our journey of faith starts by not just hearing or hearing God beckon us, but we have to say yes. Whether we say that yes verbally or we say it internally, we have to make that commitment. And it is when we have made that commitment that we begin to embark on that journey. And so I think of a scripture in Matthew chapter 22. And I'll read it quickly from verse 1 to verse 14. It says, Jesus spoke to them again in parables saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And he sent his servants to call those who had previously been invited to the wedding feast, but they refused to come. Then he sent out other servants saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened calves are butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention. They disregarded the invitation, treating it with contempt, and went away, one to his farm, another to his business. The rest of the invited guests seized his servants and mistreated them, insulting and humiliating them, and killed them. The king was enraged when he heard this, and sent his soldiers and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding feast is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. So go to the main highways that lead out of the city and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. Those servants went out into the streets and gathered together all the people that they could find, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests sitting at the banquet table. But when the king came in to see the dinner guests, he saw a man there who was not dressed appropriately in wedding clothes. And he said, friend, how did you come in here without wearing the wedding clothes? 
that were provided for you. And the man was speechless and without excuse. Then the king said to the attendants, Tie him hand and foot and throw him into the darkness outside. In that place there will be weeping over sorrow and pain and grinding of teeth over distress and anger. For many are called, invited, summoned, but few are chosen. This parable gives a perfect picture of what it is that God calls you and I to. But one of the things that we recognize, which is why this man who was not dressed in the wedding robes was cast out, was that he had been given what to wear, and yet he did not even wear it. When we come to Christ, he gives, God gives us the Holy Spirit to empower us to walk the life of holiness and righteousness, to walk in obedience. He gives us the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit empowers us to bear the fruits that God expects of you and I to bear. He empowers us to be able to live and to demonstrate diverse giftings of the Spirit. All these things God equips us with through the power and the indwelling of his Holy Spirit. So that when he beckons you and I, and he chooses you and I for a particular assignment, we will have no excuse. All we need is faith. All we need is to be able to trust that God who has called us is faithful, that when he says that he calls and he never leaves us, he will be with us through thick and thin, that we hold on to that assurance. And we can also look back on people like Abraham, people in scripture who by faith, the Bible makes us understand, did some great and awesome things for God. So today, I just want to encourage you. I don't know what it is that God has called you to do, what it is that he's spoken to you to do. Maybe you've been sitting there waiting for some other things to happen for you to kind of work out, oh, when this or that happens, I will do it. Maybe like Abram, God is saying, you do not need to know the full picture. I just need you to take that step. I just need you to first and foremost say, yes, Lord, I am going to do it. And as you move, I will be with you. And I will fulfill every promise that I have made. Because let's remember, faith is the assurance, the title deed of things hoped for. Faith considers as facts what cannot be sensed by the physical senses. And that is what God needs for you and I to apply and to remember when he's asking us to do anything. Today, I just want to go over our memory verse in Deuteronomy. Chapter 8, verse 18. But you shall remember with profound respect the Lord your God. For it is he who is giving you power to make wealth, that he may confirm his covenant, which he swore solemnly promised to your fathers, as it is this day. So be blessed. Keep rejoicing in the Lord. And I just want you to remember when God calls you, or he assigns you to do anything, you may not fully understand why, but I would encourage you in faith, so long as you know that this is God, I would encourage you to remember, the first thing to do is to say yes. Be blessed in Jesus' name. Amen.